there's the first attempt is sort of you know can I do it by hand is there is there something that kind of gives me a clue of how many solutions I get and and so forth specific I mean, in particular for KKT system where it's kind of uh, even larger but and my recommendation is you you, you, tr you do your best you know maybe with a buddy or something and see well how can I you know, can I get any information before I go to to a computer? And of course, if you can't, then you go to a computer and use some sort of, you know, either symbolic, I mean, at this point, I guess you, you would just use symbolic capabilities. Um, and you try to draw, draw conclusions from, 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 from those. I mean, so you, it's always, of course, best to, 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 uh, to use what you know and, um, and, and, advance the problem as much as you can. Then, so kind of getting stuck to one method and say, well, if that, you know, I just can't do it by hand, I'll just give up. You know, so that was kind of typical in that problem where um, there was a recursion relation I showed you. I mean, if you, if you haven't seen that, I mean, alternative would be go to a computer, you know, set certain number of variables, not general and, and see the pattern. Um, and I think the same is in this homework. So um, let's, let's talk about specifics. So, so there was a question about the ladder problem. Any other questions? From I guess I have a general question. Yeah. Frequently you set up these KKT things. You get multiple solutions. Yeah. And it's not always clear which one is to pick. I mean, other than evaluating the objective function of each, each solution and seeing where is the minimum is, or maximum, whatever Correct. Want. Well, if you have multiple solutions, and of course you can exclude the cases where the mu's are of different signs. Different signs? What about zeros? Zero you cannot exclude. Right. So, if you have multiple solutions where you have both non-negative mu's or both non-positive mu's. Well, you can you can say it's the one with the non-negative mu's are possible minima. The one with non-positive mu's are possible maxima. Um, if you don't have a convex problem, like if you don't have a co convex situation, if you're not in a convex situation, then you cannot just say, you know, I have these minima, this maxima, okay? So, um, what are the methods to kind of, kind of up, I mean, there are a priori and a posteriori methods. So, once you, f you find those critical points, those possible maxima and minima, what are the, uh, the one of the possibilities is evaluate the f objective function at those values, figure out which one is the maximum, which one is the minimum. Um, there are also second order methods which are very similar to the one, I think the one I listed was for uh, Lagrange multipliers. The one uh, second order method. Did you say you it? Yeah, I think in one of the previous lectures I said what the second order method is for Lagrange multipliers when you don't have inequality constraints. I forgot which lecture that was, but But there is uh, an, there's a similar sort of second order method for KKT solutions. And I didn't quite list that, uh, that, that um, criterion. I mean, just, just because of time, but I can, um, I can do, I can give you a handout if you want on that. Um, in the homework, did did you have to kind of figure out which ones are maximum, which ones minimum? Well, I just evaluate the 
Okay. okay. So if you have a few, then that's not costly. True, and you still got several solutions? You know, so I, we couldn't really just say, okay, use that, that sufficiency condition at all. I don't think there's any of them like that. Because I, I couldn't tell if there were them. I don't know. Right. I like, get solutions all the means where the negative is zero. So. Which problem specifically was that? Okay. And that's that's a good way. I mean, the, as I said, when you have inequality constraints, inequality constraints, in the end, you're just think looking at a feasible seat region which has multiple boundaries. I mean, basically boundaries uh, that are described by by different equality or inequality constraints. Um, the KKT solutions will be on some of the boundaries, right? I mean, there is, unless you do this systematically, second order methods, which may fail also. Um, best way is to just evaluate it, you know, evaluate it at those, uh, at those solutions. Um, yep. In number five. Mm -hmm. It's the one you actually worked at in class at one time. You find the feasible region, and then it, then it says find the extreme values of, and it gives us the mm -hmm. x one squared plus two x two squared plus x one squared. Yeah. So we're not necessarily asking for the better than max. So are we just I mean, if I saw that on the test, would I just give you the we have the points the equality set? Well, I think when it asks for extreme values, it wants the mean and the max. Okay, so it literally wants the mean and it wants the max. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how many solutions do you get when you, in this particular problem? I think you get uh, nine. nine of them. And I could exclude some of them by looking at the mu's. Right. But if you excluded all the mu's that are different in sign, then you get how many? Uh, let's see, that eliminates two of them. Okay, so you still have seven. seven. One was trivial. You know, well, that's a minimum, actually. So. Yeah. No, I mean, I mean, if you want the extreme values, you have to find the minimum and the maximum. Um, so when you're finding the extremal points, that's just when the mu's are cannot be different signs, right? Because if it's a maximum. Well, you can exclude those. Yes. But even if they're same sign, or yeah. it's not necessarily a minimum, it could still be sort of an inflection point. Okay. So in problem number four, I mean, in, in this in this practice exam, I'd say um, <coughs> you have one equality, one inequality. Okay. So you have one mu. <coughs> Um, are there extra practice exams? I didn't make extra copies, I think. Are there extras in the back? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Are there going to be solutions to the You know, I plan to have solutions on this and, and on the um, on the homework so far uh, Wednesday. Okay. Um, just because I... I realize there is, um, I mean, for a specific problem like, like number five, okay, it's, it's one thing to just say generalities, but it's another thing to kind of, kind of uh, get down and dirty and uh, work it out. Yeah, oh, no, no, five on this uh, last homework. Okay, um, well, the, let me just remember what the, for the latter problem, 
we had what? Minimizing x squared plus y squared subject to x greater than a, y greater than b, and what was the other one? bx plus a a y minus x y. What was it? Ah, you are a book company. Less than or equal than? Less than or equal than A, B, or? BX plus A, Y minus X, Y less than or equal to zero. Oh, this is equal to zero, okay. Is that correct? So, um, when you do KKT, there's going to be three mu's. There's going to be two X plus mu one corresponding to this, so there's times one, uh, sorry, times negative one, right? Plus mu two times zero, plus mu three times b minus y equals zero. Hmm? Oh, I just ordered them differently, yeah. Two y plus mu one times zero, <coughs> plus mu 2 times negative 1 plus mu 3 times a minus x equals 0 uh, mu 1 a minus x equals 0 mu 2 b minus y equals 0 mu 3 bx plus a y minus x y equals 0 <coughs> and um, Let's see, why can we exclude, we can exclude x being equal to a and y being equal to b <coughs> because Physically, yeah, but just by looking at the system, if they can't be equal to zero, then mu one and mu two have to be equal to zero, and that's true. If you have mu three, can't be zero. Mu three can't be zero. Mu three can't be zero. I see. So a equals x would make this equal this equal to this. So you would have mu three bx or B A equals zero, and mu three cannot be zero, right? So that so we can exclude X equal A, Y equal B. Okay, so what are the cases? The cases are um, well this means that mu one equals mu two equals zero. It means the system is left with two X plus mu 3b minus y equals 0, 2y plus mu 3a minus x equals 0, and um, mu 3bx plus ay minus this equals 0. <coughs> mu 3 cannot be 0 because otherwise x, would, x and y would be 0, so that's not feasible. So it means that bx plus eight, yep, mu three is not zero, so. Okay, everybody's, let me know if, if I mean, it may be obvious for some, but maybe not so obvious for others, so. Um. <clears throat> okay, so you have basically this equation, that's a nonlinear equation, and then you have two equations that are linear in, in x and y. Okay, so. Let's see, how do you solve this? Um, and I've seen this also in the previous homework. What you try to do is you try to actually just, or some of you try to solve for x in terms of y, or mu in terms of um, x and y. I think the, the important 
think, I mean, the important thing is mu3 is like a parameter. So think about it as we almost know it. And what we'd like to do is we'd like to, well, of course, that depends on the problem, but we'd like to solve for x and y if we know mu3. How do you do that in the first equation is linear and x and y. The second equation is linear and y, right? <clears throat> and you can, once you know mu, you can solve for x and y, right? So to me, one strategy would be to say, well, let's solve for x and y in terms of mu from this system, right? How do you do that? Well, this just looks like a, you can write it as a standard linear. Of course, I could just put mu instead of mu3. Minus mu b minus mu a. Right. In fact, we can we can actually even do a little bit easier. We can divide by mu. How about we divide by mu everywhere and we call one over mu to be the unknown. So let's say divide by mu three and call. Let's say two over mu three equals. I don't know, the unknown, let's call it theta. So look, if you divide by mu3, you get what? Theta x minus y equals minus b minus, I'm sorry, 1 over, let me, let me call it 1 over, so 2. Oh, no, it was, it was okay. 2 over that, so I have... So I'm dividing by, by mu. Okay, mu is unknown. So it's going to be minus x plus theta y equals minus a, right? And now, now uh, the system becomes theta minus 1 minus 1 theta x y equals minus b minus a. So I can take the inverse, right? I can take the inverse of this matrix and multiply it here and I get x, x and y. What's the inverse of this matrix? So x, y is the inverse of theta minus 1 minus 1 theta minus b minus a. For a 2 by 2 matrix, what's the inverse? One over the determinant, right? And then flip the ones on the diagonal. So it, of course, stays theta. And change the sign, so 1 and 1 off diagonal, right? And the determinant is <coughs> theta squared plus 1, right? So you, you see that you get xy to be Basically, theta over theta squared plus 1, 1 over theta squared plus 1, 1 over theta squared plus 1, and theta over theta squared plus 1, minus b minus a. Okay, and let's just go one step further. What are we going to do with this, with this uh, x and y's? We've solved from the first two equations in terms of this parameter, and we have to use the third equation, right? And the third equation didn't involve uh, mu or theta, okay? So let's just write what x is minus b theta plus a over theta squared plus 1 minus b plus a theta, theta squared plus 1. Okay, so now I remember bx plus ay has to equal xy. Right? 
So let's just uh, see that. So it's going to be what? <clears throat> Am I going too fast or too slow? Or? Why would you? I mean, why? Uh, what's the alternative of, of going this any you know any of this way? We go to a computer, and I think some of you tried, right? And what you get is horrendous symbolic expressions in A and B. So that's why you'd like to really kind of push this a little bit more to see if is there any you know uh, light in, at the end of the tunnel. Um, so I have B B theta plus A over theta squared plus one. There's a minus, minus a b plus a theta over theta square plus 1 equals b theta, I'm say, a b plus a theta, theta square plus 1 squared. Okay? So, what do we get? A squared plus B squared theta minus 2AB, right? And there's a theta squared plus 1 equals B squared plus A squared theta plus AB. plus a b squared, uh, theta squared. I'm sorry, I, I lost you when you went from the left hand side to the right hand side of that equality just above that last one. This one here? Yeah, what, how, did, how did you get from the left to the right? This is x times y. Is this correct? So I have theta squared plus 1 squared, so that goes in. One cancels this denominator, and the other one goes multiplied. And this one is AB theta squared plus AB plus A squared plus B squared. Okay. Let's say this this is correct. This looks like a third order in theta. And I think <clears throat> let's say this looks third order in theta, right? If you can so how many solutions are you gonna get for theta from here? either one or three, right? For each of those theta, then you would go and find x and y, right? x and y will be exactly those two, unique for each theta, right? Now, I have a suspicion that there's going to be only one, th there's going to be an in, uh, only one real theta. How do you how do you show there is one or three? Well, the cubic I got factored was factor this this factor? I, I don't I know similar. Same okay, but similar. You so you can factor you can factor but if you if you say you don't 
<coughs> you don't see a factorization, then how do you show a cubic function has one real solution only? For instance, you take the derivative. If the derivative is positive, then that's that's easy conclusion, right? But even if it's not, it could be an S shape that only intersects the x-axis at one point. So it's not it's not a so of course if you can factor. Shall we uh, do this the third order? I mean, you can figure out what the th bring everything on the other side with positive, and then figure out what um, so third order. equation in theta and let's just what is the coefficient of theta cubed or do you see a factorization that's quick I don't I don't think so um, so it'd be a squared plus b squared times theta cubed right what's the coefficient of theta squared well there's a 2ab here there is an a squared plus b squared here. No, but plus one. Right. Oh, that, I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you. So it's really just this and this. No, and this. So it's a b. It's three a b, right? I'm moving everything on this side, oh, okay. so everything becomes positive. A, B, and what's the one with theta? That's a big one, right? So it's going to be A squared plus B squared from here. Another A squared plus B squared from here twice. That's about it, no? Plus twice. And finally, I have AB minus 2AB plus 3AB. OK. So do we see that this has only one solution? So it's a factorization here that can I mean these things can be non obvious. So you don't see a factorization, and you don't. I mean, you take a derivative, and you still don't see it's positive. Then you would just go to a computer and say, solve it symbolically, right? unless we made a mistake somewhere. Do B plus. Okay, so let's say what well, if you have three solutions for theta, you would get three well it wouldn't be a 
too nice of a situation if you have three solutions for theta because then you have three points and you have to minimize you have to evaluate the x squared plus y squared over three points and figure out which one's the minimum. Okay. So um, let's see, shall we spend more time on this now? I don't. I don't think. I don't know. I mean, there's no guarantee. I'm going to see a factorization um, quickly. I mean, I, I'd rather not. Um, anyhow, so you get, so you get three solutions at most, but most likely one solution, and that's going to be the optimal. Okay. Um, <coughs> If you go from the, if if you if you don't want to go through any of this, you just plug in this system in in in, um, in a symbolic. What do you? How many do you get? You got four. I think you got four. Four mu's. Four mu's. So it's kind of strange, right? Did you get a four? Okay, so uh, let me um, let me work it out, and I'll I'll give you the solutions to this and to uh, the other problems as well. Um, but that's that's sort of the, you know, that's one way to kind of proceed or. I mean, this this is not the only way to do it. Um, again, not being a not being a convex, <clears throat> not being a convex constraint or or linear constraint for that matter. Um, you know, doesn't it doesn't let you just you know make uh, draw conclusions um, by just solving this. You'd have to do some some additional unless you find only one. Only one solution, and then uh, use some sort of argument saying that well, the you know there must be a minimum, you know, because if as x and y go to infinity, you know that latter can have infinite length. Um, there was another one for number eight that have you guys. Um, <clears throat> I think Jeremy, had, you, you were asking this question. Figure it out. No. Um, was minimizing x squared plus y squared plus z squared subject to xy plus yz plus xz equals 1? And you, again, you don't. Um, I mean, the first, the very important thing is being able to set up the system right. So it would be y plus z, I believe, right? And then the symmetric permutation is x plus z and 2z plus lambda x plus y equals 0. And of course, with the additional okay. Now, again, before you just run to the computer and say, you know, let me just see what, it, what I get, um, it is sort of useful if you can kind of exploit the symmetries in this in this system in some way. Okay. Um, and here's one way. You know. Uh, the way I think about it is, so there are two ways. One is again, it's linear in x, y, and z, right? Being linear in x, y, and z means what? The three equations? Okay, but think about lambda is, is, is half known. You know, 
it's a parameter. It has a lo less, it's like a second class citizen among this, this uh, variables, x, y, and z, and lambda. Okay? So think about it for a second that you know it, then you can find x, y, and z in terms of lambda, right? And you use this nonlinear one to find lambda, and then you go back and replace. Okay? That's, that's one, one way to do it. Um, and by looking at those three equations and seeing that it's, it's, um, it's a um, linear system means that you can write it as a linear system, right? Agree? What do you do once you uh, write as a linear system? Well, you'd like to invert this, sort of. But, again, it's like before. If this matrix were invertible, it means that x, y, and z would be 0, 0, 0. And that is incompatible with this fourth equation, right? So you must have that this determinant is 0 to have a non-zero solution for x, y, and z. Must be zero, must be zero, right? Again, you have a homogeneous system of, solu of, uh, system of equations, homogeneous. To have a non-zero solution, you must have the, the determinant of the coefficients to be zero. And you just compute that determinant, right? That's one way to do it. And then you get an equation for lambda. You solve that. Let's see. Um, even here, there are two, two ways. One is just work it out, like 3 by 2 determinant. I mean, I don't know which methods you know, but um, it could be expanding by a row and so forth, right? Or what can you say? If I add you know, adding actually rows to, uh, or multiples of some rows to another rows, it doesn't change the determinant, right? So if you add the second and the third row to the first row, what do you see? Two plus two lambda shows up everywhere, right? So, for instance, if 2 plus 2 lambda is 0, then you get 0, 0, 0, right? So, lambda equals negative 1 shows up as a natural um, solution. But, again, if, you, if, you, uh, if you'd like to do it the long way, then you'd have to, um, to, multiply, uh, to, to write it. <coughs> Actually, you know what? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, let me let me just do the eight um, plus lambda cubed plus two lambda cubed, right? Minus two lambda squared three times, six one, six times this equals zero, right? So I get, I get lambda cubed minus three lambda squared plus four equals zero. And you can see lambda equals negative one is, is a solution. So lambda plus one and then lambda squared, what's the next one? Minus three lambda, right? Okay, so lambda minus 1, lambda minus 
1 lambda minus 4. No. No, actually, hold on. This actually can never be... This is always positive, right? I think lambda square minus 3 lambda plus 4 is always positive, right? Because I have 9 minus 16. That's negative discriminant. So it's, it doesn't have real roots, so lambda has to be negative 1. So that's, that's the only solution. <coughs> so go back to the system. And basically, we found lambda, so we can just do the rest. So we're going to get 2x minus y minus plus z equals 0, 2y minus x plus z equals 0, 2z minus x plus y equals 0. Okay. Take a look here. If I put 3x equals x plus y plus z, 3y equals x plus y plus z, 3z equals x plus y plus z. So you can see that x has to be equal to y, has to be equal to z. Did you factor that right hmm? The lambda squared minus 3 lambda plus 4. Can it be factored? I, I did the synthetic division again. Minus 4 plus 4. Minus 4 lambda plus 4. Oh, yeah. There's a 4 here. So I'm missing one one solution. So lambda minus two squared. So lambda equals two, that's another solution. Thank you. Well, you'll see that the lambda equals two doesn't give you an x, y, and z, but uh, for lambda equals negative one, so let's just for lambda equals negative one. You get this. If I add an x in this parenthesis and I subtract it and I add it here too, I get 3x equals x plus y plus z, 3y and 3z. Okay? So I get x equals y equals x equals y equals z, and now I can just plug it in the last one here. Well, <clears throat> to get x squared plus x squared plus x squared equals 1, so x is square is one third. So x equals y equals z equals plus or minus square root of one third, right? Which would give me the minimum of x square plus y square plus z square. That's was this what we were minimizing? Yeah. To be equal to one third plus one third plus one third, which is one. Okay? For lambda equals two, two x plus 2y plus z equals 0. Notice why, um, what, what, what is the, what comes out from the first and then second and third equation? That x plus y plus z have to equal 0, right? x plus y plus z equals 0. Does anybody know how to uh, conclude this is sort of incompatible? And there are several ways. One would be to solve for one in terms of the others. For z, plug it in here and sort of get, I mean, get, get some uh, contradiction. Um, the one I kind of think is a little bit easier is just square the sum of the th of the three terms. If you square that, you get x squared plus y squared plus z squared plus twice the, this product, 
2yz plus 2xz. Right? So what do you see here? You see that 0 is some positive numbers plus 2. So that's impossible, right? You cannot have x, y, and z so that this the sum of the square. So it doesn't give any solution for lambda equals positive two. <clears throat> so that's the only one. There's you know, only one solution that gives you the minimum. Why does it give you the minimum and not the maximum? Because I think there is no maximum, right? You can go to infinity along that surface. Again, you can use you can use a you know computer algebra system if you have to. Huh? Somehow you exploit the, the symmetry. So it's like if these terms appear there, you can just add one x, add one i, one y, and one z here to, to get some. <coughs> and actually, to be honest, that can be done from the very, very beginning. When you start here, so you, without having to do any of that considerations, you can start from here by saying, if I add an x in the parentheses, you know, and of course I'm going to have to subtract a lambda x from 2x. It's going to be 2 minus lambda x, 2 minus lambda y, 2 minus lambda z equal to each other because they equal uh, the other term. And then you can conclude lambda can e either be 2 or lambda, you know, if it's not 2, you can figure out the rest. Um, so as an afterthought, as I said, you could do 2 minus lambda x plus lambda x plus y plus z, and of course 2 minus lambda y plus the same thing, and 2 minus lambda z plus the same thing, which we, you would then conclu conclude that either lambda is 2 or x and y and z are equal. Well, Never, I mean, with this Lagrange multiplier method, you will never actually get to a point where you say, okay, give me, give me any problem and I'll be able to solve it by hand. Okay, so it's, there's that little bit of, um, <clears throat> you know, frustration that you never, you, you never know that you're ready to do the next Lagrange multiplier by hand. That's why combination of computer, uh, you know, symbolic computer, uh, Computations or is uh, and and by hand um, studying by hand is sort of the best you can you can do. Um, okay, let me uh, talk a little bit about the last problem, number fourteen. The reason why um, that's an important problem. I mean, I only assigned it to the under to the grad students, but. Um, it really is uh, something we're going to be using, you know, uh, later on. So <clears throat> think about you have to solve a system. It's like it's what you start linear algebra too, right? So you try to solve a system of a uh, system of equations, linear equations, right? If you have, in many cases, this is, you know. Consistent, you can find solutions, maybe even infinitely many, right? Um, depending on on the size, the number of equations, and the number of unknowns, right? But other times is that you don't find solutions. You don't have solutions, and a simple situation is, you know, you just have more equations than unknowns, right? And some of the extra equations are just kind of incompatible with the previous ones. I mean, you can uh, easily make, so A is M times N matrix may or may not 
be solvable. Okay, so regardless of whether it's solvable, or solvable or not, um, it is relevant to look at the minimization problem, where it says minimize the following function. Now, why do we put, well, one half is not important. Why do we put the <coughs> ax minus b squared? Well, we do that, I mean, we could, in principle, just, um, well, why would we do the square of, the, of this length? So we don't have to deal with the square roots. And also, because this function is now convex. Okay, it's a convex function. Well, it's con being convex, you know that you'll find one minimum, okay. or maybe a set of minima, but I mean one minimum value. There's one unique minimum value, right? Even if the convex function is not strictly convex, you only have one minimum value. It can be achieved at several points, but you only have one minimum value. Um, now, as we'll see uh, today, is is there are actually techniques of actually approaching a minimum which are quite nice if you know there's one, only one unique you know, minimum or at least one unique minimum value. Um, so it's, 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 a, it's a just a better, much better uh, situation than if you don't know if it's, if it's convex or not. Okay? Now, how do, you set if it, how do you see if it's convex? That's kind of a better way to write it. So you consider this function, and you 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 ask the question as um, minimize f of x. Of course, <coughs> here it would be no constraint, no constraint. Okay. Now. If ax equals b has a solution, then that solution will make this zero, and everywhere else f is positive, so it's going to be. So if ax equals b is solvable, it means that the minimum of f is zero, right? But if it's not sol solvable, then it is. It's going to be strictly positive. How do you? So to find a possible minimum, you look at the gradient, and you set it equal to zero, right? It's unconstrained optimization. Well, when you compute the, the, the gradient, it's um, f. I think we started last. Well. It's useful to write this as a uh, so a vector a length of a vector square. Remember, it can be written as the transpose. So let me do it here. Is a transpose of the vector of the column. So think of it as column. Then it's the row times the column. You multiply as matrices, and you get this. And of course, when you use the properties of you know transpose of product of two matrices, just this get flipped. So it's a x transpose a transpose, and when you multiply through, you get one half x transpose a t x. I'm sorry, a x minus. Now look at what's the next thing is. x transpose a transpose b minus b transpose a x plus b transpose b. But if you look at this expression and this expression, these two things are transposed to each other. Okay? They're transposed to each other. Right? If you transpose this, you get this. 
And this is actually a scalar. It's a number. Right? So a number equal its transpose, it means the two, the two are equal to each other. So that's, that's why you get this twice. So you get basically one half x transpose a transpose a x minus twi uh, twice and the one half disappears. So it's just, let's say, b transpose a x <coughs> plus one half b transpose b, which is really the length of of b squared. But so that's that's how you rewrite f. You know, this you can see this is a quadratic expression in x, which is x1 through xn. Okay? So how do you compute the gradient? Gradient equals How do you differentiate with respect to one variable? Well, where it appears in linear fashion, there's going to be just the coefficient of that thing, right? And if we, we have to agree, how do we write the gradient? Do we write it as a row or as a column? Let's say we write it as a row. I mean, the. It doesn't matter how you write it, but if you write it as a row, then the linear term is going to be, this is going to be a row, right? Because b is, b is a vector, so this is going to be a row, and this is going to be a metric, so it's going to be a row. And that's going to hit exactly those, those uh, um, so it's going to be minus b transpose a, okay? If you agree this to be to write this as a as a row, if you agree to write it as a column, then it would be the transpose of that. That's not okay. But well, let's write it as a row. <coughs> so as a row, the gradient as a row vector, the gradient looks okay. That's of course this is going to be give uh, give you zero because there's no coefficient, there's no x x1 through xn. And of course, the most important part is, is here. So how do you differentiate this with respect to x1, for instance, with the first component of x? Well, there's going to be a product, right? There's going to be lots of products there. So you can differentiate it as a product rule. First this part, and then this part. Okay. And when you do that, what do you get? You get a half. Let's see, what's the <coughs> derivative? Let's say we keep this the way it is, and we differentiate with respect to x1, right? It's going to be the first column of a, right? Because it only hits the x1. I'm only looking at the first component of, of the gradient. And then you're going to do with x2, with x3, and so forth. So it's going to be this this row times the first column of A, right? Plus, and now you keep this, and you, you differentiate with respect to x1 here, and you, this is going to be hitting the first row of the A transpose, right? So when you do this, in the end, what you're going to see, you're going to see that it's x transpose A transpose A, plus this is a row, right? This is a row, and then the other one is going to be a transpose ax. This is a column, so we have to transpose this, right? So it's just going to give you. Um, now these two things are identical, so it's twice. So it's one half. So it's basically x transpose a transpose a 
minus b transpose a, right? So therefore, as a as a column vector, the grain of f would be the transpose of this thing. So it would be what? It would be a transpose a x minus a transpose b. So it's a transpose a x minus b. Here it would be x transpose a transpose minus b times a or a x minus b transpose times a. So in either form it is the same either as a row or as a column. Of course one is the transpose of the other. <coughs> All right, so let's let's now stick with one of them, row or column doesn't matter. Um, and now let's think of the Hessian. Okay, I guess actually it does matter in the Hessian because in the Hessian you have partial of f1 with respect to partial of f2, partial of f3. So it's probably for the Hessian it's better to use, think of it as Hessian. Think of f of a uh, gradient as a vector, as a column vector. So we're going to use this expression, right? <clears throat> For the Hessian, now it's easy because it's linear in x. So it's going to be only the coefficients of of the, of the components of x. So this is going to be the Hessian, right? So that's the Hessian. Why is this? Uh, how do we now justify that f is convex? If the Hessian is how semi-positive, what does that mean? This means that if you hit in, in all directions, <clears throat> the second derivative of f in all directions is non-negative. That's basically what this, what this means, right? And remember how we compute the second derivative in, in a given direction, say u. We multiply by the row u to the left and to the column u to the right. And for all u, okay? And well, not zero. Well, it could be zero, but we allow this non uh, semi positive definite. But this is <clears throat> what's u transpose um, u transpose a a u. This is a u transposed times a u, so that's the sum of the squares of, is basically the square of the length of this vector, and this is always non-negative, and that's it, right? So that's, that shows that f is convex, and so to find minimum points, well, of course, would be enough to, with being convex, it's enough to set the first derivative equal to zero means the a transpose a x minus b equals zero in that column representation. So a transpose a x minus a transpose b equals zero. So a transpose a x equals a transpose b. Okay. Now what's the advantage of solving this versus solving a x equals b? You may not have a solution to AX equals B, but would you have a solution to this? Yes, but with ATA, the determinant of X on the Even if the determinant of this is equal to zero, this is a square matrix. So you have the same number of 
equations as you do for unknowns. So you may get us unique solution or you may get infinitely many solutions. So it also, right? So if you're right, if the determinant of, of this product, now you can talk about determinant, right? It's a square matrix. Is not zero, then x is going to be, you know, at least in principle. Of course, practice is always a different question. What is the inverse of this matrix invertible times a transpose b? Right? Yep. You don't need the Hessian, you're right. Because, well, do you know there is a minimum? Do you need a, uh, okay, the question is, so if you, if you know there is a unique solution, I guess the next thing would be to say, well, is the function going to infinity? Okay. As x goes to infinity. You'd have to check that, and that's probably true. But, I mean, the point is that this is always going to be convex, so... I mean, you're, um, automatically you get basically that, 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 uh, <clears throat> of course, the good thing about knowing that it's a convex function is even if this determinant is zero, then you have infinitely many solutions, right? How do you find those solutions? if you have a determinant equal to zero in a system of equa equations like this. Just disregard, just basically see what the rank of this matrix is. So the rank of this matrix would, be, would then be less than the n, right? <clears throat> and just pick the kind of the essential rows or linearly dependent, independent rows, right? And then you find sort of the essential variables, and the other ones you call them parameters. And you're going to get, um, you're going to get, inf yes, I mean, a family of inf many solutions, which would all basically be give you the minimum uh, for a x equals for, for the function f, right? Because it's a, but in that case, it would be a non-strictly convex. Um, so you ha you'd have one minimum value for f, but you might still ask, well, how do I pick the actual the one to work with? And there, there are tools to do that, but <clears throat> um, I guess at some point I, sh I should actually motivate all of these things. Like, where, where do you, where do you, so why do you want to solve a system that doesn't have solutions? A x equals b and doesn't have solution. Um, there are lots of applications. Um, I know, I mean, there's lots, I mean, there's one that I've seen in kind of face recognition um, where you're trying to match sort of a, take a picture of a person and you're trying to match it with some typical faces, for instance. Um, you call those typical faces sort of the basis of your uh, face space, for instance. And what you do is you try to get as close as possible with your new face sort of representing in that basis. And you're trying to find the um, closest possible resemblance, if you'd like. Um, so even if you don't get an exact match, and you probably won't get an exact match, you'd like to get kind of the closest possible x that solves, you know, it turns out in that case is a linear system. <coughs> but there are lots of applications. Um, I should say that linear systems come a lot in um, discretizing kind of continuous systems. Um, partial differential equations um, that desc describe, for instance, um, let's say, a dynamics of some, some uh, continuous, I mean, a system that's, that's, that's taking place in a continuous 
domain, for instance, in some, I don't know, in some um, two-dimensional or three-dimensional domain. I think about temperature in some three-dimensional region. Um, how do you actually uh, describe that? You describe it through some physical law which, which, which turn out into partial differential equations. But if, when you go to a computer to actually discretize that, you get a finite, lots of variables, but finitely many um, variables that you want to solve. And you know you, you may get linear or nonlinear systems, but if you do get linear systems, that's again a situation where you want to sort of advance in time the system by solving linear systems. So you'd have to do this iter iteratively at each time step that you, uh, you ask the computer to solve, and it would be sort of linear solving linear systems. So um, becoming sort of efficient in, in solving linear systems is, is really um, is, a, is a whole field <coughs> of um, numerical analysis. Um, I think that's, I mean, for that homework problem, that's basically the recipe. Um, if, you have the, if you have the particular example, and again, I'll, I'll give you the sort of, I'll work out this um, solutions and But you can sort of, oops, um, right? So given any met, any any system with it, with you know any number of equations, any number of unknowns, so uh, m and n could be arbitrary. What you do is you compute this a transpose a, right? In this case, it's going to be a two by two matrix, right? and I think you know if it's probably it's uh, this example gives you an invertible matrix, right? Which is the kind of the first case. So you compute this two by two matrix; it's <coughs> invertible. You take the inverse, and then you multiply by the transpose of A times the right hand side, and you're going to get an unique solution. That solution is going to be. The minimum, right? Uh, and I think, how do you then verify whether it is a solution to ax equals b or not? Just plug it in, right? And if you do get, basically, that will tell you if the minimum is zero or it's above zero. That's all. That's all it's going to tell you. But um, in the practice exam problems here, number six, I'm, I'm kind of jumping over. Um, it is sort of a similar, um, <clears throat> so we're going to use this computations of gradients and all that um, to solve a system, a linear system, Ax equals b, that turns out to have a solution. So look at, look at the metrics, I mean 3, negative 1, negative 1, 3 obviously is, not, is invertible, so the determinant is not zero, right? So in principle, you can just take the inverse of A, multiply by B, and you find the solution. But, I mean, an alternative method, which is probably preferred, I mean, it will be preferred if it's a 50 by 50 uh, metrics and not 2 by 2, is to try to kind of get to the uh, solution by some sort of uh, approximation technique. And that's going to be, in this case, you know, it's just an example of steepest descent, <coughs> where you don't have to invert the matrix A. And the idea is you have this convex function. You know it has a minimum, or, I mean, you know it has a minimum value. So you basically start from whichever point you want, and you go... Um, in sort of the steepest descent direction. We'll talk about this after the break. Um, you go in the direction of the gradient, right? So what's the duration, what's the gradient? The gradient is, well, what's the function? The function is the same as here, right? The gradient, we compute the gradient. 
you're going in the direction, direction of the gradient, and you're going in that direction until you reach a bottom. Right? That is, until, until that's, you find the least value for f. <clears throat> if, that's, if that's where the gradient is zero, you stop. If not, you go in the direction of the new gradient. And again, you do that until you kind of reach a bottom. And um, of course, for two by two systems, I think, I don't know after how many, uh, maybe after two iterations, this is going to get you to the gradient equal to zero. But in general, this may not be, it's not guaranteed you're going to actually end up in finitely many steps to the absolute minimum or the global minimum. Um, so you're going to have to use some sort of um, st stopping criterion in that in that search, okay? But you know that's actually you know if you think about it, it's going to be a lot less computationally intensive because it doesn't require inverting a metrics. I mean, computationally speaking, inverting a metrics in the system A x equals B to invert a metrics A is the same as solving the system. So, um, of course, if that would be cheap, computationally it would be cheap, then you would just do that all the time. But it's not when you have large matrices. And again, when you, when you have matrices that cannot, cannot be inverted, that's even you know, impossible to do. So um, we'll talk about these kind of things, approximation techniques, today and then on, on Wednesday. Um, <clears throat> look, over, look over, I mean, t we'll take a break, 10 minute break. Um, if, if you have a chance to look over the uh, f first few problems, fine. If not, I'll, I'll mention some, uh, maybe something about them today, and I'll give you solutions on Wednesday. Um, and anyway, so let's take a break, and I'll give you the homework from last time.